Hey everybody, welcome to Altium Academy. I am your host, Zach Peterson. I'm also your local technical consultant for Altium. And today we're going to be talking about the different types of copper in your PCB stack up. Why would we even have different types of copper? Well, it depends on the manufacturing process that is used to create that copper and then apply it to your PCB laminates. So that's what we're gonna talk about today and we'll also look at how much roughness in that copper is too much. We're gonna look at both of those factors. So let's go ahead and get started. So when you're shopping for laminates and depending on the frequency range that you're working in, you might see some designations for different types of copper in the laminate data sheet. Sometimes you might not actually be shopping, you're just looking at the standard stack up that's available from your manufacturer. Again, if you look in that data sheet, you might see different designations for different types of copper. So what do all these different things mean? Well, in general, there are a few different types of copper that you will find used in PCB materials. The first and most common type of copper is electrodeposited. So electrodeposited copper is created with a chemical process. So essentially the way this works is I have a big bath of an electrolytic solution. I have a big roller in this bath and this roller rolls very slowly. And during this rolling process, the electrodeposited copper will undergo a reaction where it accumulates on this roller. As the roller exits the vat, the copper is then pulled off and then it is rolled onto a smaller roller. And then once it is rolled onto the smaller roller, it can then be used in other processes. So this process essentially controls the thickness of the copper based on the rotation rate of this drum. And you will have two sides to this. So there will be a rough side and there will be a smooth side. So the smooth side is always against the drum. Now, once this copper goes into a laminate, you'll basically have your PCB material and then on the surface you will essentially have the smooth side and then you'll have the rough side bonded to the glass resin substrate. Then in order to ensure that you get a nice strong bond to the next layer in your stack up, this side will be intentionally roughened through a chemical process in order to create some stronger adhesion to the next layer. So this is the most common type of copper, and I think it's pretty safe to assume that if they don't specify what type of copper is in your laminate material, it is this type of copper. So a variation on electrodeposited copper is surface treated electrodeposited copper. So when we talk about a surface treatment, we're talking about a barrier that prevents corrosion as well as provides the roughening. So this is just a variation on electrodeposited copper because once you take the electrodeposited copper off of this drum, it could then be treated further to provide this uh, additional roughening as well as some protection against oxidation. So this is also pretty simple to understand. Basically, as it's manufactured and then you have a rough side that is then placed against the laminate, the other side will already be roughened. And so it doesn't need any additional processing once you're gonna go and actually create the PCB layer stack. It's already ready to just be put in and pressed and then you're ready to go. So within surface treated electrodeposited copper, there are actually different types of surface treated copper. So you can have one side that's treated, you can have both sides that are treated, it all depends. And we actually have a blog link in the description. You can go to that link and check out the different types of copper that are used in PCB layouts. And that will describe the different surface treatment processes that are used to create copper foils. So the next type of copper is called rolled annealed copper. So rolled annealed copper is essentially copper that is passed through a cold rolling process. So you may have a very large copper roll here and the copper is essentially pulled off of this and then passed through a cold rolling process. And so in this process, it is pressed down to the desired thickness. And so the result is that you can get very thin, very smooth 
sheets of copper coming off of this cold rolling process. This type of copper tends to have very low roughness and it is often used in specialty laminates that are targeting high frequency applications. So when we say high frequency, we're talking like Rogers or Arlon or some other material. And they like to use this particular type of copper because it's so smooth that you don't get much additional impedance or loss from copper roughness. So we've talked about copper roughness in a previous video and specifically how copper roughness can create additional losses in your PCB. And one of the ways that you overcome uh, copper roughness is obviously to use smoother copper. And so this is why you might want to use rolled annealed copper. So if you look in a data sheet and you're looking at like a Rogers data sheet or you're looking at another data sheet for a high frequency laminate, uh, you will see a designation for rolled annealed or for electro deposited or maybe reverse treated, some other type of surface treated copper. They will state that in the data sheet. So something that's important to note about the different types of copper that are used in PCB materials is that you don't necessarily get to just mix and match whichever type of copper and laminate material you like. You are limited to what the vendor can provide you and then you can use in your process in order to build the stack up you want. However, some vendors have gotten very good at mixing and matching all of that for you, and so they do give you a lot of options. So if you're reading a material data sheet or you're reading a product catalog or whatever it is from a materials vendor, just watch for that. Make sure you know what type of copper you want to use or is going to be appropriate for your application, and then match that up with the material and the DK and TG specifications that you need for your particular application. So if you start looking at some data sheets and you want to know how rough is the copper, what value should you look for? Well, first we need to define what exactly does copper roughness mean? So if you look at a sheet of copper kind of microscopically, it doesn't look perfectly smooth. It basically has all of these features on it that give it its roughness. Same thing on the other side, especially if it's, you know, treated on both sides to have roughness. And so what we do is we essentially quantify an average or root mean squared value for this deviation in the thickness of the foil. So here we have some deviation T and then statistically or from a profilometry measurement, you can even do it visually, uh, you can do it with interferometry, you can actually quantify the average or RMS roughness of this variation in the surface topology. This RMS value will normally be quoted in a data sheet. Sometimes they will write it R sub Z, sometimes they'll write it H sub Z. They'll give it different names, but it's normally measured in micrometers. So a typical value for electrodeposited copper is gonna be generally above two. If you're looking at treated copper, maybe micro treated copper or rolled annealed, it'll actually be below two and possibly below one micrometer. Those are the different values that you should care about. If you're talking about, let's say, how rough can you allow the copper to be in your particular board? Well, what you wanna do is look at this from two perspectives. So the first perspective is to look at this in terms of what's the additional impedance that this creates or you can look at this in terms of what is the additional loss that gets created. Typically, the additional impedance is pretty easy to overcome or to compensate for, and you just to do it by adjusting the width of the trace. The loss is another matter, and the loss can actually be kind of significant if you start looking at different values of this roughness. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show some example calculations of losses that occur due to this roughness in this copper. So the typical way that we define roughness in an interconnect is as the sum of the dielectric portion plus the conductor portion. So we use alpha as the symbol for loss, normally measured in dB per length. And then we use subscript D for dielectric and subscript C for conductor. So this will include any contribution from roughness. Alpha sub D is gonna be proportional to the frequency. So it basically increases linearly with frequency. So if I were to double the frequency, then I would get approximately double the loss from the dielectric. Now, the conductive portion is approximately proportional to the square root of frequency, 
times this other factor, which is the roughness correction factor. And this is actually very important. It's been the subject of recent research and it causes this dependence to be no longer approximately a square root proportionality. Contrary to popular belief, at low frequencies, the conductive portion can actually dominate the losses. Whereas the dielectric portion doesn't really dominate until high frequencies. This is really easy to predict, assuming that you have a flat dielectric constant. Essentially, if I take omega and multiply it by 10, or I take the angular frequency and just multiply it by 10, I should get about 10 times the losses. Not necessarily the case with the alpha sub C. So the copper roughness correction factor here, this K as a function of omega, this is actually something that we'll have to do another video on because it is a pretty deep subject, but there are some common models models that you can actually use that are built into the layer stack manager in Altium Designer. There are other uh, design tools that have similar models built in for copper roughness so that you can account for this when you're calculating losses in your interconnects. So the actual equation that you can use to calculate alpha sub D and alpha sub C, those are found in a blog that are linked in the description. So it's a blog about how much roughness is too much roughness in your PCB. So go check out that blog. It has the formulas that you can use to calculate this in dB per length. Now just remember, if your R, L, C, and G terms in that you use to design your transmission line are all in, let's say, ohms per inch, so like for the resistive portion, if it's in ohms per inch, then whatever you calculate here is gonna be in dB per inch. So make sure the per length units match when you're doing this calculation. So now what I wanna do is show some example values that you might expect for microstrips and strip lines if you're actually trying to figure out what the losses are. Okay, so what I'm gonna go ahead and show here is some of the typical numbers you might see for losses in the dielectric and the conductor for different roughness models. The way you get to these equations that I showed earlier is you're approximating the square root, and I've just repeated the uh, equations here. Here in the dielectric and the conductor portions, I've broken these out into a few different cases with a microstrip at one gigahertz and at 10 gigahertz, and then a strip line at one gigahertz and at 10 gigahertz. If you can get a capacitance value, such as like from the field solver inside of the layer stack manager and all team designer, and then your target impedance value, which you basically get to choose, mostly gonna be 50 ohms, you can then plug in those values into the dielectric portion with your loss tangent, and then voila, you get a dielectric loss. So that's pretty simple. So what do you see here from these numbers? Well, we see here at about one gigahertz, if we just kind of compare all the way across this row, uh, for a microstrip, the losses are pretty similar at about one gigahertz. So if we had a perfectly smooth conductor with a microstrip in this particular dielectric, so DK 4.17 and DF uh, 0.014, which I've actually taken off of an ISOLA data sheet, we would expect to see just a little over 0.1 decibel per inch of loss. And if you compare with some uh, data like from Rogers on FR4 laminates or their Rogers laminates, you can you know, get a good idea of where that sits. And that's pretty typical. Now, if you're at higher frequencies, if you go to 10 gigahertz, look what happens to the dielectric portion. Well, the dielectric portion is proportional to the angular frequency. So the angular frequency is just two pi times the frequency. So if I take the frequency and multiply it by 10, then I would expect my dielectric losses to multiply by 10. Now that's not the same as what happens with the conductor losses. The conductor losses scale with the square root and then you also have an increase in this roughness factor. This roughness factor and the square root taken together, you multiply those out and you get about a factor of three increase for the smooth conductor and then about a factor of three increase going from one gigahertz to 10 gigahertz for the rough conductor. So what about strip lines? So strip lines already sees larger dielectric losses because they're gonna have a larger loss tangent. So why do they have a larger loss tangent? Well, it's because in the microstrip, some of the fields existing around the trace are passing through air, which at these frequencies doesn't have any loss. For the strip line, all of the electromagnetic field is confined in the lossy dielectric, so you're already gonna see a little bit more loss compared to a microstrip. So that's exactly what you see here when you do this calculation. And then if you go from one gigahertz to 10 gigahertz, you're basically taking your dielectric losses and multiplying them by 10, so you go from 0 0.067 to 0 0.677.
So that's pretty simple to understand. And then we see the same kind of scaling effect if we go from one gigahertz to 10 gigahertz for the strip line, it's about the square root of a factor of 10 increase. So we get about square root of 10 being about three, so we get about a factor three increase. Now, here's what happens inside of the strip line. The strip line is normally going to be a narrower trace for a given dielectric thickness. So here we're dealing with 4.12 mil dielectric thicknesses above and below the trace. And so that's going to require a thinner strip line. So it's already going to have higher DC resistance, but then because it's thinner, it's also going to have higher skin resistance. So we would already expect the copper losses to be a bit larger for the strip line compared to the microstrip. And then they scale in the same way because we have this square root of frequency term here. Now, what happens if we add in the roughness. So the roughness creates a big increase in the conductor losses. So those conductor losses go up when we add in the roughness. And I've shown here results for two different models. So these two models are the Hammerstad model and the cannonball Hure model. The H value, which is the average height of your roughness, and we've shown some examples of what that means in our copper roughness videos. What that does is it artificially increases the dielectric constant. So it essentially exaggerates the dielectric losses inside of the conductor, or inside of the transmission line, I should say. Once you account for roughness, it also increases the skin effect, because we're basically taking the skin effect and multiplying it by this K as a function of omega. So now those losses not only increase, they also increase further as you increase the frequency. So you can see here as we go from one gigahertz to 10 gigahertz, we get this scaling effect. And then as we go from one gigahertz to 10 gigahertz for the strip line, we also get this scaling effect. So once we have a rough conductor at relatively high frequencies, you can see here that around 10 gigahertz, these results are very similar. And that's going to persist for probably another couple of decades once you get into 20 or 30 gigahertz. Once you get really high frequencies, the dielectric losses might dominate unless you're on a low loss laminate. So once you get into those frequencies and you're dealing with low loss laminates, um, you could be back to a situation where the conductor losses dominate. So just keep that in mind because when these two control contributors to loss start to dominate does depend on this DF value. And this should illustrate why when we go to really high frequencies and we're dealing with uh, the millimeter wave range, we not only care about having a small DF value, but then we also care about having smooth copper. And you can really see the effect of having smooth copper here if you just look at this bottom row. So that's my uh, rant on this whole thing with these values for losses. You can give these formulas a try yourself to then determine what the effects of the, uh, the dielectric and the conductor losses are on your signals. So this K value, we've talked about it in uh, another video. So what I'll do is I'll put a, a link to a blog in the description that contains some formulas for these models. And you can use those formulas to calculate these K values on your own at different frequencies. And then you can use that to estimate the conductor losses in your interconnects. All right, everybody. So that's all I've got for today on looking at the different types of copper and the losses that they can create in your PCB. Hopefully this was helpful. And of course, go check out those links in the description. They will take you to some blogs where you can learn more about the different types of copper as well as get access to those formulas that you can use to you do these kinds of calculations. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you want to see more of these videos, hit that subscribe button. Make sure to leave some comments and questions in the comments section. And definitely, before you start choosing materials willy-nilly, don't forget to call your fabricator, everybody.